Coming up next, she came to the U.S. with $300, and now she's a director for NASA. And why Generation Z is the highest unemployment rate. And we take your calls. Don't move. All right, here we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm coming to you live from Ramsey Solutions Studios in Nashville, and you are joining a conversation about who you are, what you were created to do, where you want to do it, how to get there. Simply put, we're helping you figure out how to earn the paycheck you want and make the difference that you desire. How do you combine paycheck and purpose? That's what we're talking about here, and that's a fun conversation we are of course live on youtube right now if you're watching at 12 o'clock eastern standard time if you're watching at a different time well thank you for joining us but you're on demand right now so the chat room is open as well the phone lines are open 844-747-2577 844-747-2577 and let's start off with a great story shall we i mean how about an uplifting story to kind of get us all uh in a really really good place headline from the good news network she came to the u.s to study with only 300 dollars in her pocket now, she's a NASA director for the Mars rover. For a little girl growing up in Colombia in the 1980s, Diana Trujillo is now, in some ways, in an unthinkable position for most people, but not for her, an aerospace engineer. She leads a 45-person team at the NASA laboratory that's responsible for the robot robotic arm of the latest Mars rover. Here's the backstory: Born in 1983, she doubted how far she'd be able to rise in a male-dominated field of the aerospace industry. But when her dad decided that, well, I think my daughter having a second language would offer her more opportunities, and then decided to send her to live with an aunt in Miami, she comes to the United States at 17. She has $300 in her pocket. She begins to take a series of jobs, including housekeeping, uh, and put herself through Miami-Dade College. Not only did she learn that second language, English, she studied aerospace engineering. I love this quote she shared with CBS News. I saw everything coming my way as an opportunity. I didn't see it as, I can't believe I'm doing this job or cleaning someone's toilets. I can't believe that I'm working this job at night and not sleeping. It was just more like, I'm glad that I have a job and that I can buy food and I have a house to sleep in. Uh, what a story. She continued her studies. She gets through, becomes the first Hispanic woman to be admitted to the NASA Academy. And she did so well there that she was one of only two students to receive a job offer from that prestigious institution working for the Academy. While she was at the NASA Academy, she was introduced to robots expert Brian Roberts. He sees her potential. And he invites her to join his NASA Space Robotics Research Team at the University of Maryland, where she actually gets her bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. Later that year, she became a team member at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, what an incredible story of perseverance. Uh, I want to go back to the quote she shared, because I, I think that no matter where you are in your journey, maybe you're still trying to figure out what your path is. Maybe you know what the path is, but you're discouraged because of financial or relational issues that you feel are holding you back. Maybe you know the path, you're not quite sure the best way to get there, and that's locked you up. Or maybe you're on the path, and you don't feel like you're hitting the mile markers as fast as you'd like. This is what she said. I want to repeat it because it's so good. I took everything coming my way as an opportunity. Everything. What an incredible statement. Everything that came her way. You know what she's saying? I just kept on keeping on. I kept on keeping on. I didn't quit no matter what life threw at me, what job I had to do to pay the bills or to be able to eat or stay in, in the program. I did it because everything that came at me was an opportunity to continue, an opportunity to listen contribute i know it's hard sometimes so i love this story i think there's people out there that are watching right now 
you needed to hear this. Because you feel like it's not worth it. You're discouraged. I'm not sure it's going to work. I don't know if I'm going to get there. I don't know where the money's coming from. I don't know how I'm going to figure out the way. And even if I figure out the way, a little bit unsure, maybe a lot unsure. I've got what it takes. Oh, listen to me. I've been there. Oh, have I been there? Ken, you're 33. You're going to get into broadcasting? What? You don't have a degree in broadcasting? You don't know anybody in broadcasting? You got three kids? Wife? Got a small business you got to run in order to pay the bills? Dude, the chances of you getting there are one in a billion. So you're telling me there's a chance. (laughs) I think Diana felt that way many times. And she didn't quit. I hope that encourages you. Diana, you are a heroine. My goodness, what a great story. That should keep you in the game. 844-747-2577. Hey, let me tell you what else is coming up next. We got our work fails. We got a couple of good ones today. Oh, my goodness. We got... I would say both of them are pretty cringy, as the Coleman kids say. And so cringy makes for good television and good radio, good broadcasting. So that's coming up. You don't want to miss that. Um, And we've got some information for you Gen Z folks out there or parents or grandparents of Gen Z. Got some relevant data. And I'm going to give you some practical encouragement. So all that is coming up. But let's get to the phones. It is your show. It is a free phone call. Amanda is standing by, 844-747-2577, 844-747-2577. You know what I got to do, Trevor? Uh, So, you know, I like to do the cast of characters. By the way, I had somebody tell me the other day, they go, I really like when you talk to the team back behind the glass. I go, great, because I'm going to keep doing it. (laughs) We got Nathan, the director. He's calling the shots. We got three cameras. So there he is. He's waving at you. Of course, there we got, oh, we just went back. We got Joe. Joe's been with me the longest. Joe is like, Joe is the like producer emeritus because he's done everything for me, right? And he's running the sounds, the boards, making sure everything sounds great. Look at that guy. Look at the stuff he's got in front of him. It looks like he's, it looks like you're flying to Mars, Joe. Look at, show all these people, all these fancy buttons. And then just to the left of Joe, you've got Amanda, the call screener. She's joined the Ken Coleman Show team uh, this week. We're very excited about that. She's screening calls. And then in the background, we're not going to be able to see him. They've done this on purpose. We have Trevor, the YouTube guru. Uh, There he is. There he is right there. He's waving at you. So Trevor is a YouTube guru. He, He helps us with everything about the content, what you all want. He's monitoring the chat room. So if you misbehave in the chat room, Trevor is going to digitally slap you. Um, So that's what that means. But he's a very nice guy. And then Madison, the producer, Uh, Madison is now the producer of the Ken Coleman show. She and Joe have got so much going on. They both have combined duties. And so Madison is awesome. You can't see her. She likes it that way. Now that she's in charge, she has everybody in there terrified. And so we may never see her, Joe, on camera again. It's just you and me, pal. We're the only ones. Because what you don't know about Joe is, uh, Joe has, oh, there she is. Oh, we snuck it in. There she is. Joe is a longtime radio pro, too. Not just an engineer and board genius and editing guru and all things. Joe used to do news and traffic reports on WDUN. So, Joe, you didn't know you were going to do this. I need you to go into Joe the news guy or Joe the traffic reporter. Give us five seconds of what you would have done back in the days in WDUN. Pull something out and give us five to seven seconds of Joe the radio guy. A small herd of sheep exploded on Highway 65 this morning. Oh, wow. Very <laughs> gruesome, Joe. I know. Did you ever have that headline where a sheep truck? Oh, uh, actually, in Gainesville, it was chickens. So we had a lot of chicken trucks that overturned. Yeah, chickens everywhere. Oh, yes. Oh, Joe, that's fantastic. Makes for a mess. So anyway, Joe is, Joe is uh, he's worn more hats than anybody in the control room. So anyway, that's the team. That's my team, who I know and love. And so uh, now to the chat room, I got to ask, what do you think of the bright orange sweater chat room? Hello, uh, you don't like it. Nathan does not like it. 
Said Man- it looks Amanda like Amanda doesn't like it either? No. Why? Kind of looks like a pylon. You know, like a traffic cone a little. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Joe, do you like it? Well, it's different. <laughs> Hey, that's I, Joe. That's Joe saying he can't stand it. That's, <laughs> it's about as negative as Joe gets. Madison, what's your vote? Are you gonna go shoot a buck after this? <laughs> I was gonna say a hundred. Yeah. Trevor. Bro, it's it's a no for me. Why? <laughs> I, I really need to know this. It's it's, it's kind of abrasive. Abrasive. It's a little abrasive on the eyes. Wow. Batteries not included. I'm of a mind right now to quit the show now and go change sweaters. I really like the bright orange myself. And it's, it's probably compounded because you're right in front of all the blue. Yes. Well, I got to tell you, all you video people it's have an opinion, contest. but this is a J. Crew orange sweater. And uh, I just think people, like, I'm not the only person in the world to ever wear a bright article of clothing. But clearly, I'm going to have to wear this more is what my conclusion is. So there you go. Nathan, you like it. You just don't like it for video purposes. I like it. Hey, okay. the chat loves you. Oh, here we go. The chat room. <laughs> Thank you, Shmuel Cats. The sweater is beautiful. Uh, Mint State said it's bright, but it's Friday. Marika says the shirt is fine. Zap says I like orange. Thank you. The people have spoken. I don't care about you folks. I just spent all that time loving on you guys, and you guys shot my sweater down. Uh, but there you go. No, I'm kidding. I really do. So it's fascinating. A little too strong for some of you folks. All right. Well, got my yellow pencil, and I've got a regular pencil. We've spent enough time on the sweater having fun. Here we go. Um, Don is up first in Albany, New York. Don, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. You bet, Don. How can I help? So um, my question is, how do I get past the disappointment and the pain of being pushed out of the only profession that I know. Mm. Okay. Well, let's dig into this a little bit more. What, what is happening to be more specific with your being pushed out? Sure. So I've been doing what I've been doing for just about 10 years now. And so much has changed in the 10 years. Uh, for example, so I'm a dietitian, and I prefer outpatient work, meaning that I work with individuals one-on-one to improve their health. Okay. Like not in, not in nursing homes, not in hospitals, but in outpatient settings. Okay. And what I've been noticing with the jobs that are advertised now is that they're requiring that dietitians be multilingual, uh, that they... Or also, they're hiring health coaches that are less expensive to hire for roles that would have previously been held by dietitians. And the market is getting more and more saturated because they're offering more easier programs, different pathways to become a dietitian. Got it. So I'm sending out resumes left and right and just not getting any calls back. Okay. So that's why I feel like I'm being pushed out. No, you're not. You're not being pushed out, but I understand your feeling. And I'm glad you shared that with me because I think it's important for you to put that in perspective. Um, all of those things that you share are certainly factors, right, that make it a little bit more competitive. Is that a fair way of saying that? Do you agree with that statement? I'd say a lot more competitive, but sure. Okay, great. A lot more. All right. However, you have a lot of experience, yes or no? Yes. Okay. You have a good amount of experience. I don't think you really believe that. So tell me what you believe about your experience and how valuable you are based on your experience. I think that perhaps the experience that I have may not be that attractive to employers. Okay. But there are some things that you could do that would change that. Yes or no? I've started, haven't had too much improvement. I've tried to get additional certifications, hoping that it would help me stand out um, so far. Yeah, but see, the the standing out part I'll address in a second. The standing out part is why I wrote the book, The Proximity Principle. Okay? And I'm going to explain that in a second. But I want to make sure you separate the issues that you're you're dealing with. Sure. So issue number one is, can you get certified and get more certifications that on paper make you more uh, valuable, the answer is yes, you can. 
could you begin to take a second language? Could you, could you become bilingual? Well, the answer is yes, you could. And so you have to weigh that versus do you want to stay in this health coaching dietitian space? And if the answer is yes, then we go about doing that. All right, that's one issue. The second issue is how do you get noticed and how do you level the playing field? And the way you level the playing field is through real connections to where somebody goes, oh, now I see Dawn, and Dawn is not another resume. Dawn is a real person who I've heard great things about and comes to my knowledge as a result of somebody else that is credible in my life and in my work. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So those are your two issues. So let's go back here and let's just really meet this head on. Do you want to stay in the dietitian uh, or nutrition or coaching, whatever space? Honestly, I'm conflicted. Yeah. I go back and forth. That's what I'm wondering. What do you go back and forth between? At one point, I really liked it, and I felt strongly that there was a, a future for me in this. Um, but on the other hand, presently, I'm thinking maybe I should cut my losses and go back to school for something else or get training in something else that might have more longevity for me. Yeah, but see, I'm not about longevity. Longevity comes with with being in your sweet spot. When you use what you do best, you know this, you've been listening to the show enough to call me, to do work <laughs> you love, to produce results in the world that you get really fired up about, well, longevity comes with that. So... I'm not sure that you know what else you would want to move into. And I'm really wondering that if if diet, if being a dietitian wasn't super competitive right now or whatever, whatever, all these factors that make you question it, you know, if, if you were crushing it, making good money and helping people get healthier as a result of, their, of them eating, would you be considering this? Or do you really not no. love? Okay, so there's the answer. No, you wouldn't be. So if I put you in a great gig tomorrow with a good salary – good benefits and you're able to help people with their with their eating and their health as a result of what they eat you'd be pretty fired up or would you just be satisfied no i think i would be happy with it okay so the so then the issue is not do i change careers and go back to school when you don't even know what you would go do see going to school doesn't just automatically fix this issue because this issue has nothing to do with another career in school. This issue has to do with some frustration that you've got right now. And I think that frustration is starting to move towards desperation. Like, oh my gosh, I'm sending out all these resumes. I can't even get a job interview. I'm doing the wrong thing with my life. I got to figure out something right now. I got to call Ken. Does that sound right. about right? Yes. Okay, then. So I'm glad you called because you need fresh perspective. You need to get clear. And what you're clear on is that you love the work of serving people. You're good at what you do as a dietitian. True or false? True. You love the work of being able to consult with somebody, coach somebody, advise somebody. Is that fair? Yes. And the results that you get fired up are what? You tell me those results. Oh, that my clients experience from working with me, the results? Yes, yes. They improve their control of diabetes. They can reduce the need for dialysis. Yeah. They reduce their cholesterol levels. Don, when was the last time you had a client thank you for what you did for them? Usually every day, at least one. How's it feel? Good. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, but I mean, does it when you see real change in somebody's life and you're able to realize that I had a part in that, that should make your heart swell. Does it? Yeah, it does. Good. So no more of this, oh gosh, should I change careers and go to school? No. The answer is you shouldn't change careers unless we say career is a job, function, or title, but you need to be in the space where you are researching, analyzing, creating a plan, and then advising, coaching, encouraging them on the plan to see bodily 
and let's call it even emotional change as a result of the physical improvements. That's what fires you up. So what are the different ways you can do that besides being a dietitian? I'm okay with that exploration because I think there are multiple ways to do it besides just being a dietitian. But the real thing that's going on with you is you've not gone about getting opportunities the right way because you're doing it just like everybody else does it. I submit resumes and I hope I get noticed. Well, we're in a very competitive job market right now and your field is very competitive above and beyond that as you've explained to us. So you got to use the proximity principle, which says this. This is the principle, then I'm going to give you the book, okay? Because there's an actual book that I wrote that became a number one Wall Street Journal bestseller. And I've talked about it on the show. The proximity principle says in order to do what Don wants to do, dietitian, okay, fill in the blank, however you want to fill it in. In order to do what Don wants to do, she's got to be around people that are doing that in places where that is happening. So you've got to really comb through your connections and relationships and past work, and shake the tree, shake the apple tree, like my brother and I used to do on my grandfather's farm, <laughs> those little apples. You would jump up on those branches, and we would just jump up and down and shake those branches, and the apples would fall off. You get that. But you got to get out there, and you got to connect. you got to get around people in your industry and tell them, hey, I'm looking to break through. What do you think is the best way to get qualified? What additional certifications do I need? Do you know somebody that's hiring over here? I want to get into this. What are some other things you recommend? When I flock with birds of a feather, good things happen. And so I'm going to give you the book. Hang on the line, whatever format you want. Audio book, e-book, or the good old-fashioned hard copy. It's called The Proximity Principle, The Proven Plan, it's Proven Strategy That Will Lead to the Career You Love. I wrote it for people who know what they want to do, but they're not quite sure how to get there. There's five people in five places. There are archetypes in the book. And I'll introduce you to them, show you what to do when you get around them, and then in those places, and how you will learn how to get in the right place or get around the right people, and then opportunity knocks on your door. 844-747-2577. Garish is up next in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Garish, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, sir. What can I do? Well, uh, first thing, your sweater is... is is good thank color. you i like that color thank you it makes you feel good doesn't and, it garish <laughs> yes yeah you know what second, fooey on all those people that don't like the bright orange on video i don't really care i'm gonna wear i'm gonna get a color this bright in all of the palettes just to irritate the crew all right go ahead second thing <laughs> secondly i just appreciate your team because at least they are transparent and they are honest with you oh yeah they are they're just jealous though i mean that's what's really going on they just don't feel they could pull this color off is what really is going on but that's okay i appreciate that i kid i um, kid we're having way too much fun it actually they enjoy it because garish they're always looking for the opportunity to to speak some truth in my life so when i open the door they come at the old ribs but they love me so i know that yeah just just like your intro of 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 the NASA director from a school to a NASA director. Uh, my story is kind of very similar to that. Mm-hmm. I did come to the United States in 1990 from India with $300 in my pocket. Wow. Today, today um, I have two MBAs. I have um, CPFs, a Certified Business Forecaster mm-hmm. Certification, mm-hmm. CPSM, Supply Chain, certification and cpm which is supply i mean certified purchasing manager certification so however when i came to united states after going to uh, college uh, my first job was with public supermarkets if you know public supermarkets sure. um, in lakeland florida i worked with them for 19 years a uh, very good company great company uh, but i was uh, through personal reasons um, you know, divorce and me getting custody of my three kids and raising them by myself. And months after they grown up, you know, I was not able to grow in the company. And I said, okay, it's time to move on. So I, I worked for BASF. And uh, I always had a job throughout my career in the United States. And uh, two weeks uh, ago, I was laid off. Uh, because, as you know, of the COVID-19 and BSF wasn't doing financially well. Mm -hmm. So I was informed about my layoff in the middle of November, right before Thanksgiving. And since then, November, December, January, February, uh, I have applied to hundreds and hundreds of 
uh, places. Um, and out of those, most most of them, I don't even get phone calls. I don't even get letter. I don't even get anything like that. Um, I've done so far about, 50, I mean, 12 interviews. And out of the 12 interviews, eight of them very was within BASF, okay, with the same company, uh, and I was not successful. And and the other four were outside um, that I wasn't uh, wasn't successful. However, a um, little bit of a context: my profession is in supply chain. My certification is in supply chain. My expertise is in supply chain. But some of these jobs are a little bit slightly different, like being a business manager, meaning that you got to have a little bit marketing uh, kind of knowledge, segmentation manager, which is little also marketing. Okay, so let me jump uh, in. But- let me jump in. So so do you have any kind of marketing experience or the, those nuanced experiences uh, or type of experience that you need for some of these jobs you've applied for? No, I don't have a very specific uh, uh uh, experience okay, in them. so so here's However, the deal. I, know, I have the industry knowledge. I get it, and I think you've got the talent to pull it off, don't you? Yes. I okay, so here's the, the deal, though. Is, I... So it's just like our last caller. So the uh, and, and let me understand this correctly, because you gave me a lot of information. You've done all of this in two weeks. You've had twelve interviews in the two weeks since you've been laid off. No, 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 no. Since November. That's what I was saying. Oh, I thought since, you said you got laid the... off two weeks ago. Yes, yes, but the notification they told me. Oh, I they, see. They, they, I got you. Okay, okay, okay. So here, here, I just was curious because I was like, man, that's unbelievable that you've done all that in two weeks. Four hundred uh, applied for four hundred jobs. I was like, wow. Um, I was going to send some scientists down to study you because I was like, that's unbelievable productivity. So I misunderstood. I'm sorry. So here's the deal. So number one, don't apply for things cold. Period. Like I, I'm just not a fan of anybody just submitting a ton of resumes and just hoping that I hit the resume lottery. Uh, I know a lot of people still do that, but we have now in this country, there are 16 people that are unemployed for every job that is available. That's a pretty dramatic flip from where we were a year ago. Uh, Well, just slightly over a year ago in February of 2020, there were more jobs available than there were people who are unemployed. Now we've obviously we've seen that flip. So, so in a situation like that where you're just applying online and you don't have the experience that is, is, is needed or that is specifically called out for in the job description and, and, and you're making it sometimes to an interview, it sounds like, sometimes you're not even getting to the interview. But the reality is, so is me, that, okay, we so got to get, if, if, I, if I may, what you got to get to the, yes, you may, but you got to get to the point, Garrett. You gave me a lot of information. I need to know your question yeah. and how I can help you. Yeah, to, to get to your point, when I was talking about the marketing positions and the segment manager positions, that was only within BASF. When I'm applying all outside, I'm applying to my expertise, all in supply chain. Okay, great. What's your question? Because I feel like I was trying to answer you and I don't think I am. So what is your specific question well, that I can help you with? My my question is, I'm I'm basically doubting myself. Is it... Is it uh, I, I don't know. Is it my resume? Is it my LinkedIn profile? Is it? I, I have no idea. I can't. Why, an, why well, is it? I can't answer that specifically. But that's not the right question to ask anyway. So, you are just submitting resumes, and you're relying on LinkedIn, your profile. When they look at you, you're just applying with everybody else. That's why I teach the proximity principle. You have got to sit down and go. All right. When I apply for a company, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, I don't care what the company is. When I'm applying, do I have any connection at all to somebody in that building? Now, I know this is very different, folks. And a lot of you go, golly, that's so hard. Well, the way you're doing it's not working, folks, plus garish. Because you're just submitting a resume and you're hoping that against everybody else, they look at you. And by the way, people, hiring managers are spending 7.4 seconds looking at a resume. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000, 7, 1,000. Boop. 
if you're putting all of your hope in your resume being scanned and somebody going, woohoo, doesn't work that way. You might get the interview, but even in the interview, if there's no previous credibility of relationship, your, your odds go down. So what we teach here is that when I'm looking at a company, I'm going, I want to be there. I'm going, okay, I can look at LinkedIn. I can look at Facebook. I can look at Instagram. I look at all my social networks. I can look at my actual acquaintances. Okay. In the area I live, Allentown, Pennsylvania, that includes coworkers from where I just got laid off. That includes parents of, of my kids, uh, friends who we see for soccer or hockey or whatever, my church, my social uh, functions that I do, maybe where I work out, whatever. And so what we do is we say, hey, I'm looking at this company, XYZ, and we put out the word. Anybody work at XYZ? Anybody know anybody that works at XYZ? And, and again, if you play this out long enough, you, and it doesn't take months and months and months many times, but you go, okay, I just got to start there. And does anybody know anybody? And we start there. You'd be surprised. Yeah, I know somebody, I know somebody. And so what we want to do is, is we don't just want to submit a resume. We want to say, hey, can we make a connection over there? Can I have coffee with that person? Can I do a Zoom? Can we help with the phone? Can we do an email exchange? Hey, my friend Garish is a rock star. Got all the supply chain management stuff. Uh, beyond that, he's just really gifted at this, 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 and this, which is what I teach. Get the career clarity guide. Do it. It's free at KenComa.com. Do a self-assessment. Get other people to give you feedback so that you know how to talk about yourself in 30 seconds or less. And spread the word, 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 spread the word. Not just, I'm going to go online and I'm going to submit 400 resumes and hope that something hits. See, here's what, it, it lulls you into this false disappointment. I, I've submitted 400 resumes. I'm not getting any bites. It's like saying I bought 400 lottery tickets and I haven't hit the lottery yet. I mean, literally, it's the same thing. So would you be really disappointed if you bought 400 lottery tickets? I mean, would you be devastated and discouraged and want to quit life because you bought 400 lottery tickets and you didn't hit the lottery? Would you, Joe? No. I think you'd go, ah, shucks. Don't know if I'm going to buy 400 lottery tickets anymore. That's kind of dumb. I hope that's what you'd say. Now, who do I know at the lottery company? <laughs> yeah, right. But that doesn't work for that one, Joe, but thank you. But where the analogy goes bad. Point here that I'm making is we got to be really, really, really intentional and strategic on the front end, not just hit a bunch of buttons and wait. You know, it's kind of like crab pots, Joe. When somebody goes fishing, they're throwing lines, they're moving the boat around, they're ch changing bait. When you go, when you do crabbing, you just put the bait in the crab pot, throw it in the water, and you come back the next day or later that afternoon and see what the tide brought in. That's not how to get hired. So, Garish, hang on the line. Amanda, let's make sure he gets all of our free resources, the Get Hired Guides. All three of them are free at KenColeman.com. You download them. Give him a copy of my book, The Proximity Principle. That's why I wrote it. I I don't talk about it every day because it feels like, like I'm promoting a book. But I literally wrote the manual on how I, at 33, entered into a new industry, broadcasting, with no degree and no experience. And, Joe... You were there and watched it. Did I do what I wrote about in the book? Yes, you did. Thank you, Joe. And I give you a very clear, easy-to-follow plan. It's why I wrote it. My gosh. I, I, I just can't say it enough to folks. You want to know how to get opportunities? You're frustrated? If you want people knocking on your door, grab the power of the proximity principle. And whether you buy the book or not, I'm just going to tell you, it's about putting yourself around the right people, putting yourself in the right places. That's when opportunity finds you. The right time happens when you're in the right place. But if you're just sitting at home, firing resumes, and I'm not saying that's what Garish is doing, but I'm making the point here, folks, that if all I'm doing is submitting online resumes, I got news for you. That's not putting yourself actively and intentionally in the right places, around the right people. So there you go. All right, quick break. When we come back, some really funny work fails and some new data for Generation Z, the mosaics, and why the unemployment rate is so high and what you can do about it. Don't move.
Our world is changing, but so are we. Now, we see a smile through someone's eyes. We conquer our struggles and cherish each moment because we are shielded through faith and assured by hope. And greatest of all, we love. The world is different, but so are we. All right, welcome back. So um, we love doing this work fails uh, segment because it, it, it never ceases to amaze me how our humanness sometimes gets us in some hilarious situations. And we do this for two reasons. Number one, we do this to entertain you, uh, just to kind of give you a little light, little lift, if you will, through some humor. And secondly, to make you feel a little bit better about maybe something dumb that you've done, right? I mean, we've all done dumb. And, uh, Joe, I got to tell you something. I feel like at some point we need a work fail from you. I just got to believe, and you're the consummate professional. Today's not the day. But I feel like there's got to be some hilarious stories from all those years you basically helped run and move things around and operationally and all that at WD. And there's got to be something. So I just want you to think about that. All right, here we go. Um, For you sports fans out there, Madison, this one is going to – Oh, boy. This is going to fire up the conspiracy theorists who think every referee is against their team. By the way, I've got some friends like this who I will not name, but they make watching a sporting event, and I also have a family member, which I can't name, who is like this, to the point where it's unbearable to watch a game with them. Because I have no problem getting upset at a ref. These are humans. They do make mistakes. And when it costs your team, oh, boy. Okay? But there are types of people in the world, Kentucky fans and Alabama fans, <clears throat> who think that every call that doesn't go their way has got dirty money attached to it. Like, it's got gangster money. Like, they just think that any call that doesn't go their way is a conspiracy. And some friends and some family members. But I wanted to at least throw some shade at Kentucky basketball fans specifically and Alabama football fans. Un- insufferable. Joe, you may not be that way because you're a good human being. Well, thank you. But this story, this story is going to rile the sports fan who thinks all refs are evil. Referee Tim Peel in the NHL has been banned for life for a hot mic situation recently involving Madison and the greater Nashville area's beloved Predators. The Nashville Preds, our NHL team. Uh, team Browder, family Browder, they love them some Predators. Uh, which, by the way, you need to remind Mike that I would like to sit in his seat sometime soon again. So, Peel, and this could have something to do with it. This guy, Tim Peel's 53, and he was supposed to retire after this season. So, maybe he had, maybe he was just a little bitter and really ready to be done. We don't know why Tim did what he did, but this is what he did. Um, he had refereed over 1,300 games in his career. And uh, in a recent game with 15 minutes left in the second period, uh, he called uh, a tripping penalty on Predators forward Victor Arvidsson. And just a few minutes later, the Nashville broadcast team overheard audio from Tim Peel saying, about this penalty, it wasn't much, but I wanted to get a blanking penalty against Nashville early. What? You got a score to settle? We don't know. This article doesn't tell us. Did he not like the Preds coach? Who, incidentally, was very classy when asked to comment on it. Took the high road. I won't get into what he said, but he took the high road. So, uh, here we go. Referee on his way out the door has got got a grudge Got a score to settle. So I'm going to call a penalty. Yikes. Uh, Don't be that person. If you're on your way out, finish well is the point. We get a lot of calls. Ken, how do I resign? How do I leave well? Well, let me tell you what you don't do. You don't leave with acrimony. Like this guy, he just didn't care. I've never liked these Nashville fans. I guarantee you that has something to do with it. 
there was a grudge that this referee had with something Nashville. Could have been one fan that's an idiot that got his attention one time. I don't know. Maybe a couple players didn't like it. Maybe his, maybe his childhood sweetheart who broke up with him on prom night was from Nashville. I don't know. It was something, Joe. He was a short timer. Short timer. Because he was going to retire in April anyway. Yeah, that's that's a part of it. But he had a grudge. Exactly. So here's the point. If you're leaving a, a place, a toxic culture, and we get that call a lot, look at me, folks. It just doesn't serve you well. Just, what do you care? You're gone. Get a voodoo doll. Go with friends outside the office. Have a couple drinks. Get it off your chest. Just don't do anything at the office. Go ahead and leave well. Don't blow up the bridge is my point. You know what I mean, Joe? Walk off the bridge gracefully, turn around, give them a wave. Don't detonate the entire bridge and hit as you've walked across. That's the point. All right. Here we go. Oh, boy, I got to get going. Uh, Let's see. Oh, boy. Okay. Now, Madison and I talked about whether or not to do this, and I think this is great. Chat room, this is for you because you all get to give instant feedback. Here we go. Uh, This is from Raquel, who's a listener, and this is about one of her colleagues. So this is why Raquel's so excited to share this story. Uh, Another assistant at the same office I work at decided she wanted to lose some weight. So she decided to take a certain weight loss pill that eliminates fat from your body as soon as it goes in. Now, I want to pause for a second on this and say, if you're buying a pill, okay, that is guaranteeing weight loss by just taking the pill and does not involve changing your eating regimen and adding exercise, I've got news for you. There ain't no free lunch. Can I get an amen, Madison? Okay, Madison's lost over 100 pounds, changed her life. She didn't do it with a pill. There, it ain't such a thing. Here comes the evidence. Literally. Hello! So two days, everything's going fine for this colleague of mine. So we decide to go to lunch. She eats her usual lunch foods, which unfortunately are not very healthy. On the drive back to work, she starts squirming around and exclaims, we need to hurry up. (laughs) Because she's got to go potty. Oh, gosh, we finally got there, but it was too late. She didn't make it. She pooped her pants. She exploded. Oh, no. Say it isn't so. Well, fortunately for her, she had some regular clothes in her car, so we brought them in to change, and she continued to work at the front desk uh, because she didn't have any scrubs to be able to work in the back with patients. One week later, we go to lunch again, and the same thing happens. This time, instead of asking us to bring her clothes, she emerged from the bathroom in tears because she had nothing to change into and she was scared that our boss was going to fire her for pooping her pants twice in one week. So here's the issue. Is pooping your pants twice in one week a fireable offense? Amanda says no. Madison is unsure. Joe? He's not sure. Chat room, what say you? Here's the deal. I don't think that pooping your pants while on a dietary supplement twice in one week gets you fired, but I think we pull them in and go, listen, this is not great judgment. It's not great judgment. So either you bring extra clothes every day at work so that if you keep pooping your pants, it doesn't affect your ability to work, or you take, t- or you stop taking the dietary supplement. I'm not, as your leader, going to tell you what to do, but you need to address this. So I, I'm not going to even reprimand Nathan. I'm just going to go. How's this working out for you? All right, and then let him go. I think the humili- the humiliating act of that, is punishment enough. So no, I don't think it's fireable. I don't. I wouldn't fire somebody for that. However, let me say this. Here's where it gets to be fireable. If we have that conversation, you keep doing that, and you're with a patient because none of us can control when the body goes, it's time to let go. And so she's with a patient, and that happens. Oh, my word. What do you do then? I think now we got a problem. That goes in the old file. That's what I think. They got to add the uh, must be potty trained in the job description. 
Yes. <laughs> you ruin it for everybody. It's one of those deals. Now everybody's got to go, oh, I'm not going to eat spicy food. I have to be able to hold myself and not work with the pens. I don't know. There it is. All right, real quick. Here we go. Uh, as I promised, some uh, in the news, Joe. Do we have it? There we go. Uh, Two billion people in the age demographic or the generation of Generation Z globally. Now, these are folks born between 1997 and 2009. And that represents about 30% of the total global population. And listen to this. In just a few short years, 2025, it's predicted that Gen Z will make up about 27% of the workforce. So here's the gap that's going on here and, and what we can do about it. Parents of Gen Z, uh, grandparents, friends, uh, and then you Gen Z that are uh, enjoying the show. Um, compared to all the other generations, baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials, the most recent 2020 data shows that Gen Z has an unemployment rate of nearly two times more in almost every country. And the timing is not good because Gen Z is graduating from college and high school, trying to get out in the workforce. And obviously you've got a pandemic affected work economy. Um, here's the other thing, a little bit of a perfect storm. Gen Z is also the age group that is overrepresented in service industries, restaurants, travel industry related jobs, and they were hit very hard. For example, in the United States alone, around 25% of young people work in hospitality and leisure sectors. Between February and May of 2020, employment in these sectors decreased by 41%. So they've been hit really, really hard. So what do you take away from this? Number one, be encouraged because in the United States, we're seeing those jobs come back. And I think they're going to come rushing back within the next quarter. I think in the next two to three months, you're going to see those travel and leisure hospitality jobs come back. So number one, be encouraged. It's not the end of the world. Number two, you are young. So take advantage. Don't have too much pride. Stay living with mom and dad for a little bit while you're hustling. And then again, look for how those industries have adapted. Don't just assume that the only job I can get are the traditional jobs in that travel leisure and look to, okay, wait a second. Can I drive delivery? Can I get into administrative and service type jobs where I'm serving others? I just may not be in the hospitality or leisure industry. So what you want to do is, hey, think of entrepreneurial opportunity as well. Don't, you know, don't look down on anything. And here's the other thing. Be okay with multiple jobs. If you got to do two or three jobs to equal what you would love to get coming out of college as you're trying to get in, go for it. Bide your time. Things are looking up. Don't get discouraged. All right, that is going to do it for me. My time's almost up. But before I let you go, you matter, and you do have what it takes. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, this is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on.